Today I'm going to be answering a viewer question about validation on the web. I'm going to go ahead and read the question to you, show you a bunch of different solutions and then give you my recommendation based on my experience. So I wrote this book a little while ago and in chapter four, there's a chapter about writing testable forms where we talk about client side validation. Uh, the reader found it very interesting, which is great, but has some questions about his application where they need server side validation. Uh, they need server side validation presumably because they don't want to store wrong data on the server. In addition, there are definitely some smart users out there uh, who are going to try and make a request without using a GUI and enter junk data in your database. Of course, you probably want client side validation as well. This is primarily for a good user experience, which is something we obviously want to provide as front end developers. In this particular reader's case, he has two sets of validation rules. He's got the front end copy, which is mainly for user experience and the back end for the actual data integrity. So he says, do we need client side validation? And is there a better way to resolve this situation? It turns out the answer is it depends. And I'm going to show you what it depends on and what I think you should do. So I've seen all these different approaches uh, throughout my career. I'm just going to quickly share them with you. So back in the day, I used to be a Rails developer. Uh, it was a great way to start off my career and I learned a lot. And back then we did the traditional server model. Uh, this is very simple. There's no JavaScript. Basically the user will type in their information to a form, they submit it. If everything's okay, you create the record. If it's not, you re-render it with the errors. Uh, if you used the web in the early days, you will remember this. You'd type your password and then your password confirmation. Then you'd have an error in your form and the page would refresh and you would have to retype your password and password confirmation. Well, it was very frustrating, uh, but that's how the web was back in the day. Uh, either way, this is actually not a bad solution for a lot of cases, especially simple forms. Mainly, it's very beneficial because it's cheap, simple, and reliable. When I was doing Rails, I was working on lots of different applications at a consultancy. And one of the things you need to keep in mind is the value to time ratio. And a lot of the time, if you want to build something quick and simple, Rails is really good. And being able to do it quickly uh, is obviously very beneficial for both the client and the developer. So this does work very well for simple applications. Think username, password, that sort of thing. Uh, but it is painful for very dynamic forms. So uh, you can't use this solution for everything. But if you can get away with it, you definitely should. If you need something more complex, dynamic, or just uh, better user experience, you may need to use the client-driven uh, form model. Um, this is probably the most common one nowadays that you see. I'll just run you through it and tell you some of my experiences. So generally, if a user fills out their form, uh, there's not going to be any submission or API requests yet. We do all the client-side validation. You can either do that when they submit the form using JavaScript, or you can do it on each keystroke. Uh, and based on that, we're going to go ahead and make client-side validation where possible. Uh, if you need it, you can make an API request, but generally you want to do this in JavaScript. There's going to be no latency, so the user gets very quick feedback about the, uh, what they've entered in the form. If everything is fine, you do nothing. If there's an error, you can show an inline error, and this is generally a pretty good experience. Eventually, they fill out the form, everything is fine, and they're going to submit it to the server. And we assume at this point, if we've done everything correctly, everything is fine. If there is errors, you can go ahead and throw them, or you can just let the universe explode and log it to your Sentry or whatever application logging you are using. So one of the benefits of this model is it's very flexible. You can do anything. Very good for dynamic forms. And where I used this was when I was working at a company called DoseMe, where we built uh, some precision dosing software. Uh, we had both approaches, actually. Our sign-up form were traditional uh, because it's simple. And when we had to have a form to enter patient data, we used this input flow here. And we actually opted for this universe explodes one. Uh, it turns out the universe did not explode too often. And the reason was basically our use case was letting clinicians enter their patient data. Uh, we assume the clinician knows what they're doing. And we don't really know how tall your patient is or how much they weigh or their gender. We can only really assume you're doing the correct thing. Uh, so in this case, we just let users enter whatever they wanted. If they entered some junk data, it was really just going to be their problem. They couldn't really use the application correctly. When they went to generate uh, a dose simulation, the models would internally error because we can't recommend a dose for a patient that's 10 meters tall, for example. Uh, so this actually worked very well. It was a great user experience and we didn't need any server validation. So it was actually okay. In the viewer's or the reader's case, uh, this is not the case. They need both server and client validation, which is very expensive. Uh, you need to define the rules twice on the client and the server. Uh, if you're using different languages, you're probably gonna introduce a bug. Uh, and there's going to be, uh, it's just complicated, right? It's going to be complex, it's going to be expensive. There's also a lot more decisions to be made as well. Like, do we validate the form as a whole? Do we do it on keystroke or do we do it on blur? It turns out the most common uh, way to do this nowadays is called reward early, punish late. So this means you validate on blur. 
You assume the input is correct until the user has finished typing in it. And when they tab away, tab away from the input, we're going to validate it at that point. Uh, so this is probably the most common model I see on the web nowadays. Uh, it's very expensive to build and it can be pretty buggy as well. But either way, this is one solution if you want to have both client and server validation. I'm going to show you one other approach and then make a final recommendation, which is actually another approach I've only just discovered recently. So one application which I'm working on right now uh, for a client is actually a front end using Vue and a back end using uh, Django. I don't have access to the back end, but what it basically does is serve up rules in uh, an array. So I get something like an email with a regular expression and an amount with a minimum, a maximum and required. I server gives me the rules and then I implement them using a very simple JavaScript uh, wiring. It is still JavaScript that needs to be written and there's still room for errors. So uh, this is kind of a more simple and cheap version of the modern uh, flow we have over here. Uh, I don't really think this approach makes too much sense and I can't really recommend it, but it is an interesting way to do it. I think the, the reason we're doing it this way is basically this has been defined a long time ago in Python and we're just trying to reuse that as much as possible. Either way, uh, there's another approach I found recently which I really like, and I'm going to go ahead and share that with you right now. It's, I'm calling it a server-driven client incremental approach, also called the Instagram model, since that's where I first discovered it. Basically, it works like this. You pick your favorite client model. It can be whatever you want, maybe the on-blur model where you validate the input after they blur or tab away from the input. You validate the entire form, so not just the input that was uh, typed into, everything. And then you render the errors for the dirty inputs. I'm going to show you how this works in action, and then I'm going to talk about my thoughts. So if I head over to the Instagram signup page, I'll go ahead and refresh it. We have nothing, everything's fine. I'm now going to go ahead and type in an email address I'm hoping is not used, and go ahead and blur this, and it's going to validate. Uh, you can see it attempted to validate, and there we go, it is valid. If we look in here, we actually have errors, which is kind of surprising, right? It's saying the username field is required, and I haven't filled that one out yet. Because I haven't blurred the field, it's not dirty, it's not actually rendering the error. But what's happening here is the entire form is validated every single time. There is no client-side validation on Instagram. This is all server-side using uh, Python, I believe. Uh, but they're simulating having client-side by incrementally updating the interface based on the server approach. And this is actually very good. Uh, the reason I think this is a good way to do it is because you only have one source of truth for your rules, which is going to be your server-side validation you still get most of the benefits of client-side validation, which is incremental updates, and not allowing them to submit that form until everything is valid. Uh, just to give you an example of how this works again, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set my 3G to be very slow. So I'm simulating a slow network connection. I'm now going to go ahead and enter an email. I'm assuming it's not going to be available, something like Lachlan at Lachlan.com. And it's currently valid. And after the request finishes, this is now going to become invalid. So you saw there is a bit of latency if I'm on slow 3G. And that's because we need the full network ship before the form is going to be validated. It turns out uh, that's probably not the biggest problem, especially if most of your users are on decent internet connections. You can just go ahead and uh, do it on the server and everything is going to be just fine. Let's go ahead and try again. Uh, there we go. You saw it was invalid for a moment. Now it's valid. Probably not the best user experience, but uh, let's face it nowadays, a lot of the time you're not really optimizing for the best user experience. You're looking for the balance between uh, the best and cheapest engineering experience and the user experience. Uh, if you want to build the perfect application, you can, but it's going to be time consuming and expensive and it might even not be delivering that much value. So uh, good to think about your requirements there. Either way, I think this particular solution might be good for the user. Uh, it's not using client-side validation, uh, so it does eliminate the topic I talk about in my book, which is client-side validation. Uh, but it definitely seems like a pretty good approach if the critical thing in your application is not the user experience, but the integrity of your data. If you need both of those to be perfect, uh, I guess you kind of need to go with uh, some sort of version of this model up here where you have the full, full set of rules on the client, and then you have the full set of rules on the server and you kind of aggregate or consolidate them in some fashion. Uh, this is definitely the most expensive, uh, most buggy, but I think it has the most potential to be the best user experience. Having said that, if you are willing to take a little bit of a hit on the user experience uh, to make something that's very simple and cheap and uh, rock solid, maybe this is a better approach, uh, especially if the integrity or the validity of your data is mission critical. Uh, either way, I've shown you a bunch of different approaches, all that I've used in production successfully, and I don't regret using any of the approaches, so I think these all have their place. Uh, if you have a better approach, please let me know. Uh, these all feel like they have problems. Uh, I wish there was kind of a silver bullet, 
maybe there's not, but if I'm missing something or you've got a recommendation or you have a, a preference, please let me know in the comments. Either way, I hope that answers your question and gives you something to think about, and I will see you in the next video.